people on average spend three and a half years writing their first book. And then they would, they would sort of miss some important components just at the finish line. So what often happens is you create a beautiful book, you've got a nice cover, you've got a nice interior, you've got a great story, you double check the proofreading until your eyes are swimming. But then people would not create a strategy for monetizing and launching the book and really claiming their thought leader status that can be associated with that. So it's a little bit like going to university to get um, a degree, perhaps like you become a doctor, and then not thinking through opening your practice and actually you know, taking advantage of your degree. Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those people watching us from around the world, they say, okay, we know where Canada is and we think we know where British Columbia is on the West Coast, right? Right. And then we have this big town city called Vancouver. Well, we are 500 miles north of Vancouver or for our friends in Europe, about 800 kilometers, which puts us in the center of British Columbia, right in the middle, north, south, east, west, big, big province. Now, the other part of, British, uh, of uh, Prince George in particular is about 80,000 people, about 120 probably in the region, and lots of forest, lots of nature. Within 50 miles, we've got 100 lakes. And then the other part about us is we have black bears, grizzly bears, caribou, deer, wolves, you name it. We live in harmony with nature. Now, you have to promise me or I don't tell everybody because otherwise they all want to come here. <laughs> so today- Sam, I live in British Columbia too when we've got bears. You know, people are just friendly with the bears. You go, okay, well, there's a bear. <laughs> okay, exactly. So our guest like today is uh, Aurora Winter and she is very, very special. Aurora is an MBA, is a successful entrepreneur, best-selling author, and we'll talk about all of those things, TV writer, producer, and the founder of uh, samepagepublishing.com. Using her expertise in film neuroscience, she helps people tell memorable stories that build brands, books, and businesses. Experts turn to her word and wealth. Aurora, welcome to my show. Oh, it's great to be on the show with you, John, and I look forward to giving your listeners some tips about how they can turn their words into wealth. So tell us about your background, because you are, have a very, very close connection to British Columbia. Well, I think I'm a lot like you in some ways. I'm a serial entrepreneur, I seem to have that creative, ambitious uh, gene in common. And yes, I grew up in, in British Columbia and uh, I've always wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer since I was nine years old and read C.S. Lewis's Narnia series. So I've gone on a whole communication journey, including being an award-winning film and television a screenwriter and executive producer. And if you're in film and television, all roads lead to Hollywood. So eventually I did uh, you know, move to Los Angeles and I had my own film and television production company also worked as a vice president of production. So I know about communication, both as an entrepreneur, when you need to communicate effectively, what problems do you solve? Who do you serve? What change is it that your product or service provides? But also as an entertainer with a background in film and television, I had a company that I launched that um, made eight films. We raised $5 million on the EIS tax shelter scheme. And when I was in um, with an executive working for Canada's largest film and television production company, I had a development budget, which means a budget for writers, one and a half million dollars a year. So I bring quite a few things to the table so we can discuss. You, you spend a lot of time in Vancouver, right? And, and, yes. and you went to the University of UBC in Vancouver, right. uh, which is University of British Columbia. And then there are stories related to that. You met your husband, that would become your husband there. And then unfortunately he passed away at a very, very young age. So it's quite a story about your life, not just all the successes, but also the times that were really challenging. 
It's true. As a young, uh, as a young woman, I met and fell in love with uh, a man who later became my husband. Uh, we were studying at University of British Columbia. We studied economics. And he would sit in front of me in class and he would put his, his arms over the chair so that his bicep wouldn't be. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, okay, that caught my attention. <laughs> Maybe if he'd lived to be your age, he would have been doing bodybuilding competitions. Anyway, we were, we were, we graduated, um, uh, studied economics at EBC. We were madly in love. He was working uh, for Xerox as a salesperson, and I was working for Urbanics Consulting in downtown Vancouver doing market feasibility studies. <laughs> but we were so madly in love, we couldn't stand being apart. So we thought, well, what business can we start with no money? And because I had, my father's an economist, I like, I like number crunching. So I was able to do the market feasibility study of starting a new business. And we started a, actually a yacht a boat rental business, a yacht charter business. And uh, we started it on Vancouver Island, just north of Nanaimo. And we, we met with the owner of Schooner Cove Resort and told him our idea, two young kids with you know barely a nickel to rub together. We thought we would come and, and uh, open a little office at the marina and rent other people's boats. And, my, and that the dinner that we had that night at Schooner Cove Resort, before we knew whether it was a yes or a no to start the business, my husband proposed. Or I said yes, so many of my husband. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, so we started a, a yacht rental company because we thought he was a sailor and I was good at crunching numbers. What business can we start with no money? Exactly. And most people only use their boat a few weeks of the year. So we uh, offered to manage renting it out for them when it was available and Makes taking sense, the management. Right? Makes sense. Yeah. And then later yeah. I asked a multi million dollar question. We saw in British Columbia at that time that you could. Um, get significant tax benefits from renting real estate. And so I just wondered, well, I wonder if we could do that with boats. And after investing $20,000 with lawyers and accountants, found out the answer was, yeah, you could do that with boats. So that then became a multi-million dollar business. It doubled our profit margins from 12% to 24% because we were providing not just a boat, not just a boat that could be rented and generate income, but we were also providing the know-how and the the information uh, that lawyers and accountants needed to get big tax savings. So if you bought a boat, say for $100,000, you would get a 7% investment tax credit year one, which is $7,000 credit. And then you could write the boat off at 33 and a third straight line depreciation, which was huge. <laughs> I would say, yeah, no kidding. Huh? Yeah. So that was... Uh, one of the first businesses we sold the yacht rental business for six figures when we were still in our 20s and then we went on to focus on the yacht sales business pacific quest yacht sales it was called and then my husband died <laughs> completely sucked. can i ask what happened uh, aurora we were yes we were actually building our dream home on the lake in whistler which is a ski resort in british columbia i'm sure yeah. you know john but the benefit yeah. of the listeners and my husband was the kind of person who's like, oh, I can figure out how to do anything, but he wasn't, he didn't have your expertise with wood and construction. This is the first home that, that he had ever built. Um, and he, we'd poured, he'd, he'd gotten the foundation, um, um, what do you call the framework for it? And then yeah. he was pouring the concrete and the pumper truck driver was pouring concrete and my husband was holding onto the rubber sleeve. And my husband, who was in his early 30s, said, watch out for the power lines. <laughs> and the pumper truck driver, who was like in his 50s, like, I'm not going to have this young buck tell me my business. Anyway, he hit the overhead lines with the metal arm. I heard the boom, and I was five miles away. It took out the power for half of Whistler. My husband fell to the ground. The pumper truck driver fell to the ground from the kind of the boom of it. But they both got up. And my husband thought he was fine, but he was not. And he died, you know, he died not that day, but a little bit later. And, uh, and it was very, very likely that the electric shock, which causes an interruption to the heart, was the cause. He got electrocuted. Exactly. I, I could have said it that way, but. <laughs> yeah. So he was only 33 when he died. I was 31 and our son was four. So as you can probably imagine, John, devastated. I was devastated. It totally uh, derailed me. It was like being run over by a truck. 
And I just had never thought of that, had no plans or contingencies to, to handle that. But I had this little four-year-old boy looking up at me with such trust. And I had to figure out a way to make my life work and make it work for a little family that was only two people now. Yeah. And so I, I did. But I suffered and I certainly had my um, dark days. But what it inspired me to do or forced me to do, if you like, is two things. One, uh, I fell to my knees and prayed because I didn't know how to handle this. And I felt like uh, being humble and asking for help to spirit and other people was part of the recovery process. And then I also used my intellect and I studied happiness. I studied grief recovery. I studied how can I get through this? How can I get past this? How can I transcend this? Emotionally, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And there are things to do. And later I founded a company called the Grief Coach Academy to help people systematically heal from grief. And even yesterday, it was interesting. I met with a friend who was going through a difficult time. She's got a fantastic company. She expected $15 million in funding to come, you know, a month ago. And now she's waiting, waiting, waiting. And that's such a hard place to be. So I did one of the coaching processes that I invented called the peace method with her. And she, she shifted from a, a discouraged place to an empowered place in just, you know, a half an hour chat. So these skills are useful for everyone all exactly. the time. Exactly. Yeah. In all kinds of situations, right, that may happen. Uh, yours were, you know, and when I read about it in the book, and the book is this one, <laughs> and I look over your shoulder, Aurora, and, and you send me your book, and as you already can see, I'm wearing it <laughs> out already. I, I, I spend a lot of time in the plane uh, going back and forth to North Sandwich every day, and then I travel around North America because we do a lot of business, but I have this book always with me. And uh, oh. you know, because you're an inspiration to me, and, and, uh, and, and we're going to do a lot more than just reading the book. But, uh, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I see it over your shoulder and very, very important. You know, so well, I'm really glad that you're getting so much benefit from Turn Words Into Wealth. I love seeing people like yourself with the book all yellow highlighted and dog eared because it's been well read. Um, if people are interested in the coaching process, I wrote about that in a different book called Grief Relief in 30 Minutes. And you'll also see over my shoulder there, for those who are watching on video, I have a new fantasy series, Magic Mystery in the Multiverse is the first book. The second book is The Secret Multiverse Academy, which I'm launching the third book on Kickstarter now. So yeah, I like all kinds of writing, fiction, nonfiction, and I love helping people. So, you, so where did the writing come from? Is it something that you... Was it directly and indirectly related to UBC and your studies there? Or were you always a writer or always enjoyed you know, writing? I always enjoyed writing. When I was nine years old, I remember the moment that I decided to become a writer, which most people don't. But I was nine years old and I loved the, the Narnia series by C.S. Lewis. The first book in that series is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. But there's several books in the series, six, six I think. And I remember as a nine-year-old reaching up on my tippy toes in the school library to, to reach the last book in the series, which is called The Last Battle. And as my fingers touched the spine of the last book in the Narnia series, I felt such strong emotion. I felt a mixture of anticipatory grief because it was the last book. And after this book, there were no more in that series. But I also felt such excitement that I would get to to read it and explore another magical world. And in that moment, I realized that, that writers are like wizards. We can transport somebody else to another place and time with just black ink on white paper. And I thought, wow, I would love to be that kind of a wizard. I would love to be a writer like C.S. Lewis, and I'm still working on it. Like, you know, you sent me, thank you so much, your wonderful books. These <laughs> books are part of your legacy, you know, living young, dying old, Finding your passion, living the dream, the ADHD <laughs> book, against all odds, They're beautiful books, mm. and these can change people's lives. 
even after 100 years from now, after you are gone. And so, you know, C.S. Lewis changed my life. He's one of my mentors, but he was already dead. So I love books for so many reasons. Also, here's an interesting, surprising thing. Uh, I just want to add to that story, and then I really want to hear what you want to say, John. C.S. Lewis helped me twice. Because after my husband died, I read his book, A Grief Observed, which is actually his diary of healing after his wife died. He initially pub published it under a pseudonym. And it helped me understand two things, that the wild midnight moments, as he called them, were a normal part of grief, that I didn't need to shoot myself now and get this over with, that I wasn't going crazy, that it was that grief is a very intense emotion that I hadn't had before. And it also um, later uh, inspired me to publish my journal of or diary of healing, which is called From Heartbreak to Happiness, which Dr. Wayne Dyer endorsed. So I love books. I think they are such a powerful way for people to bless the world. Like you've put decades of your experience into your books and anybody could benefit from having, you know, 10 hours of conversation with you. But on the other hand, Anybody can read your books anywhere around the world and get to know you intimately and benefit from all of your life experiences. So I'm book crazy. <laughs> and the interesting about a book is, and that's what I find, is that the book is you. The individual is you. The best way to communicate is through a writing a book. And, and I never fully appreciated it to the extent that you address it and turn words into wealth, not only into wealth, but all in also sharing your experiences, mine, yours, and others that write about that in particular. I'm a storyteller. That's who I am. And, and, mm -hmm. But I'm a late bloomer. And, and, it, uh, and we all go through difficult periods and, and, and uh, emotional, physically, and all of these other things. And that lays the foundation of who we are today. And that experience, yeah. once we survive it and get through it, and then evolve from it uh, you know, into a whole new world. For a long time, I didn't know who I was. Uh, you know, and, and that probably lasted until... I already was, uh, uh, as you already know, but just sharing it with uh, the people that are watching us, that we, uh, I was born in 1940, November the 1st, 1940, actually. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be uh, 84. And, uh, you know, so the uh, 84 years young, I say. And uh, so in Holland, and then we were, that was during the war years, and we saw far too much that we should not have seen. And then we were liberated by the Canadian Army, April the 12th, 1945. And it made mm -hmm. such an impression on me at five years old that I wanted to go right from that point forward. I knew I was going to go to the land of my heroes, Canada. I wanted to go when I was 17. My parents wouldn't let me, so I was drafted into the Dutch Air Force for two years, and then I left when I was 23, but academically, I was not a success story. I failed grade three. And I, fa I saw that. <laughs> and I failed grade seven three I failed times. Grade three. <laughs> yeah. I said, the other day I was giving a presentation to a few hundred people, and I said, I failed grade three. And I said, who fails grade three? And the lady in the back said, I did. I said, okay, just the two of us. You know, so, but <clears throat> in any way, then I failed grade seven three times. And then people said to my parents, what do we do now? I said, well, send them to the mentally challenged school. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We'll, we'll teach them a trade. And my grandfather was a master carpenter. I never knew him, but I saw his work, an amazing individual. And, and, so, and my dad worked in the lumber industry, and so I liked lumber. And, and they said, okay, well, let's send them to at 13 to the furniture factory. So they did. And I became a furniture maker. And, and yeah. at nights I would go to the college. But kids are hard on each other, even then at 13. And, and I had all kinds of friends, but they go on to college and university. And, and I became a laborer. I'm proud of that today, but then I was kind of looked down at. 
And so, but yeah. I felt that about me, there was something about me that was different. And I always, I knew I was just as smart as the others, not better than, but I had to prove it to myself. So going to my dream to go to Canada was very important. The second one was, I had another dream. I wanted to build my own lumber mill. And I wanted to start with nothing. You know, so I left Holland with a suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and, and then very little money and uh, flew into, couldn't speak the language, didn't know soul, didn't have any money, and then flew into Montreal, took the train from Montreal to Vancouver. My God, that is a long way. Four days, five nights. I have done that. Yeah. Oh, my God. And anyway, I landed in Vancouver, went to the immigration department. Fortunately, there was a German fellow there, and I could speak some German. I told him what I wanted to do. He said, Prince George, go to Prince George. That's where you build the lumber mill. And, and wow. so that's where I am today. 60 years later, I can still see the area where the Greyhound bus station used to be and where the bus arrived with my suitcase, my three books, two sets of clothes, and I counted my money at least three times. I had $25.47. But what I wow. have lots of is attitude. I've always had a positive attitude. I avoid negative. No matter how tough the day is, I'll swear it'd be a better day tomorrow. If anybody says something different, I said, don't even get close to me because I believe in that is always a better time and, and we are so lucky. And then the other thing that I had is my passion. And, and no matter what I do, I give it 125%. And the other one is work ethic. I work harder, even still today at nearly 84 than anybody. I get up at 5.30 in the morning. I, I always make my bed and I always think I'm late. And, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I do. And, and what then, a great story. Yeah. So then I started as a cleanup man and then uh, gradually wound up within a year and a half. I was the superintendent of one of the larger mills here. And then within 10 years, I started the company, Brink, uh, the Brink group of companies, Brink Force Products. But the interesting part, that's the point really I want to make, uh, Aurora, is that even then people said to me, you're so successful. I didn't feel that way. I did mm. not. And it was not until I was here already for 32 years, I already was successful in business and it was not until I walked into a bookstore here in Prince George in January 1997 and I picked up a book, I still don't know why, and the title of the book is Driven to Distraction, ah, okay. written by Dr. Hollywell, medical doctor. and. Mm -hmm. So I opened the book and I started reading it and it was all about ADHD. Mm. And I said, oh my God, that's me. And I <laughs> wrote in the book here, this is the actual book, January wow. 1997. And I wrote uh -huh. in the book in Dutch because I was ashamed of it, is that now I finally know who I am. And so... This I get chills. Changed, changed my so life. There's an example of how a book can change somebody's life. Exactly. You know, the, and, and that's what it is all about, right? So the, the more I started reading about it, the more I started understanding ADHD, the more I stood understand it's not a liability. It's not a dysfunctional area or mental disorder, but it's a superpower. And yeah. I believe that deeply it allows me to do things differently, but still it's in my mind a superpower. So I felt an obligation. The more I found out about it, the more I had to share with others that are struggling. That's with one it. of your most popular books is your book about ADHD. Although I think it, the other ones need more love and marketing because uh, they're all really quite good. Where is that? Yeah, you had book. it in there for a minute had it in there against all oh here it is. yeah that this one. book is very yeah. popular on, yeah. on amazon and has a lot of great reviews so adhd unlocked check it out if you if you have it or you think you might have it or you know somebody that might have it it's interesting at uh because right now i my focus is i'm devoted to helping uh, thought leaders uh, create publish and promote their books and what I've noticed is we usually do it by speaking. So I interview people. I've got what I call the spoken author method. 
And so that's easy and fun. Most people can talk up a storm. And I see that you were interviewed for many of your books. You can talk up a storm, but a lot of people are confronted when they have to type something or write something because there's different kinds of intelligence. And our school system really uh, honors mathematical intelligence and verbal intelligence. My older brother is a genius with um, scientific and mathematical knowledge. I happen to be, you know, uh, blessed in the linguistic ability. I love words. I've studied words. I'm very quick with words. But you have a different kind of expertise, a different kind of way of understanding the world from what I understand, more tactile, more uh, physical. So getting hands-on, doing the hands-on is your your one of your core geniuses. And that just doesn't, it wasn't respected in our school system, wasn't no. honored. I but, was, you know, so many people need to get their hands on it to learn. Exactly. The, the, I'm, I always was very good at numbers and uh -huh. I was a good writer, but I mm. also have the, the ADHD and dyslexia. So the uh, same as Dr. Halliwell that wrote the book Driven to Distraction, he is ADHD, wrote 18 yep. books about it, actually five on distraction, one of the most popular individuals globally on the issue of ADHD. And actually your, pod uh, your podcast with me is number 321 on the brink. Oh. And, and I did, after all these years, I did a podcast with uh, Dr. Halliwell, and that's oh. podcast number 203, uh, wow. you know, with Dr. Halliwell. Can you believe it? And, and he wrote this book in 1993, and I bought it in <laughs> January 1997. So the interesting part about Dr. Halliwell, up to that point, in particular, I thought that it was believed that the frequency of occurrence ADHD may be 8% in that area. And then I found, no, it's much higher than that. Maybe as high as 20%. So when I interviewed Dr. Halliwell, I suggested to him, he's the expert, not me, saying that I believe that it is 20% or more. He said, no, John, it's 25% or more. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with him. The other thing that I found is that I've been quite successful in business, being on board of directors and being very involved uh, in, in organizations is that I believe also that I suggested to Dr. Halliwell that of the successful and the operative is successful CEOs and entrepreneurs, in my opinion, 50% of them are ADHD. He said, no, John, 75%. And I agree with him, you know, so. Uh, now, this is what I've actually noticed, like in, in my business, which helps, you know, entrepreneurs create books. I've noticed like, well, I would say about 40% of them are dyslexic or have ADHD. And I or thought, both. well, that's, or both. <laughs> I do. And they, and these people have a different way of looking at the world. So their books are fascinating. It's like, that is their superpower that they see things differently. That's caused them a lot of grief because our world is not set up for people who are dyslexic or have ADHD. And a lot of times they've been shamed you know, that they couldn't do things that were normal, but they can do things that are extraordinary. Exactly. And many of them, as you were saying, if he's saying 75% of the really successful CEOs um, are have ADHD or dyslexia. And, and one of the reasons likely is that, uh, you know, the, for me, this, I, did, I do also audios on my book, you can well imagine it go, takes me longer than it does other people because of my dyslexia, but still it's important to do that. The, the other part about it is in terms of entrepreneurship or being CEOs, my training obviously is different than the people that want to universities and teach about business and blah, 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 and all the other things around it. So if the box is like this on managing, because of my benefit of being ADHD, what I do is I follow the box as well, but I have a tendency of going outside and saying, how about this? Or how about that? Yeah. Why not this? Why not that? And that makes the traditional CEOs, classic thought CEOs, it makes them uncomfortable when I do that. But it makes me successful where other people are not. 
yeah, more of an innovator. Well, what prompted you to write four books? That's a good idea, good, very good question. Uh, so how it all happened is that already with this one, against all odds, I had so many people say to me, even a long time ago, 20 years ago, they, they started saying to me, you've been so successful, you should write a book about it. And I always kind of felt that I was a good writer and, and I would start, I would stop, I would start. Now, writing books is not easy, as you know, and it involves a lot more than just writing and all the other things around it. And so then about five, six years ago, and then I'm now in my den in my late 70s already, if I don't do it now, it will not happen. So I mm -hmm. started to write in earnest, got a team around me, and then that evolved in against all odds. And all mm -hmm. odds was meant to be not how successful John is, but more about, and you've read it, all about the ups and downs associated with it and staying the course. I felt I had yeah. an obligation to do that. And that's why I wrote this one. And then ADHD, uh, the second book that I wrote, this one, is that I saw so many families and young people in particular that were affected by the thought of ADHD alone and were trying to deal with it that I felt not only speaking about it in presentations that I do, I had to write about it. And so that's yeah. why I wrote uh, ADHD Unlocked. And then after doing that, I knew I was a writer. I knew how to do it. I knew what I found, it yourself two books later. <laughs> I, I discovered myself. And the next one says that, uh, you know, I wanted to write about, I heard on one of the U.S. channels that, uh, forget now which one, that of all the 75% of the people that work in the United States don't like their jobs, and I believe Canada yeah. is the same, and that 70% yeah. of the 75 are looking for another job. That was the one area. And then the other one, I do a lot of presentation to young people, especially in colleges, universities, high schools. And, and you see, when I do presentations, I ask them respectfully, what are you going to do when you finish? And a lot of them say, well, I don't know. I said, well, it's, it's critically important because most of your time you're going to spend in a career or a job, or whatever it may be. And, and to like what you do most of the time is very, very important because you take that home with you. It will affect your life. So I felt then I had to write a book about that. And the book is Finding Your Passion, Living the Dream. And that saying that now at nearly 84, <clears throat> I've been in a job since I was 13. So, John, the question is, are you living the dream? I am. Even at 84, every day I enjoy going to work and I love what I'm doing. And it changes your life. That's important. It changes your life. It keeps you young. Yeah, and then the other one that I just want to quickly touch on is the one that I worked on is this one. It's a picture of me, actually. Uh, it's amazing. The, There's great pictures inside. It's like I, awesome bodybuilder. I'm the <laughs> oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America and getting ready for the Arnold's, uh, you know, so, and, and so I love now writing books and then I'm a presenter and then I love doing podcasts. And the other part that yeah. I'm working on, I'm going to talk to you about in particular at, at some point, but I'm going to touch on it so that people that are watching us today can follow us as we go forward in my dream to create a platform globally and mm -hmm. in the next two to three years and i'm now at the point where i have the foundation ideas but now i have to attract experts to bring that to life and put it forward and so that's kind that of where exciting. i am and that's where A new project. i want to engage you in that process uh once we start talking about it uh, and then our guests watching us from around the world can follow us as we launch it probably before the year end uh, you know this whole new idea and concept 
Well, you got my curiosity up there. Do you want to share a little bit more on the podcast? You're going to save the secret. So we're off air. Yeah, probably probably a little bit early, uh, you know, things that are important that maybe you can touch on things that are critically important. And as we go through uh, the seven points or whatever they are, as you use it, even in your in your book, you talk about platforms and, and all of those things is saying that critical obviously is presentation. Name is very, very critically important. I have it. I'm still protecting it intellectually very, very important. And then, but I will share it with you once we uh, are off air in the next week or two, when we really start talking, get together and saying, okay, that's where we want to go. That's what it will look like. Uh, audience, uh, you know, obviously we both are already uh, likely in the top 1% podcasters globally. So there is an audience that, uh, that we are presenting certain things that are attractive. My books is another part. You touched on it already. We can do more in terms of the marketing side of it. That is, again, another part of it. So for our guests watching us, so what I say today, I have three silos of business, actually four. And the fourth one I will touch with you and you are involved in that. The one is lumber. I'm a lumber manufacturer. I have my lumber mill, a number of them, uh, and then uh, still growing and expanding, doubling, tripling in size, maybe, just negotiating. The other one is uh, warehousing, distribution, and logistics. We're probably the largest warehousing company in Northern British Columbia. And then the other one is uh, real estate, uh, residential, commercial, and in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in industrial. And so we have one of the largest ones there as well. And then the next one is the exciting one I call media. That means books, speaking, platform. And, and so that is now in the process. The book's already there. And, and you will talk about how important books are to somebody that wants to present themselves to the world Books are extremely important because that's you, especially when they are storytelling. I'm doing another book, actually, that will come out in June. It's about communications. and, and <laughs> My favorite topic. Yeah, so, and your favorite topic. And, and again, your book, immensely helpful. You will be helpful in that process as well. So that's kind of where I am. That's where I'm going. So, so I love this, that you're in your 80s and you're launching a whole new silo, the whole media company. So let's give the listeners a little bit more of a taste of one of the reasons that I wrote Turn Words Into Wealth. So I've been helping people uh, create their, their message and help them grow their business for a number of years. And I, of course, as a book passionate lover, I encourage people to write books. But one of the things that was very heavy on my heart is people on average spend three and a half years writing their first book. And then they would they would sort of miss some important components just at the finish line. So what often happens is you create a beautiful book, you've got a nice cover, you've got a nice interior, you've got a great story, you double check the proofreading until your eyes are swimming, but then people would not create a strategy for monetizing and launching the book and really claiming their thought leader status that can be associated with that. So it's a little bit like going to university to get um, a degree, perhaps like you become a doctor, and then not thinking through opening your practice and actually, you know, taking advantage of your degree. Like you mentioned a little bit earlier, there's so much value in writing the book, whether or not anybody reads it, because it helps you clarify who you are, the gold in your story, the traumatic experiences that actually changed you in ways that you can appreciate now and share with others. So there is value in writing a book, even if nobody reads it. But I wanted to encourage people, inspire people to think through how are they going to monetize their book. So in Turn Words Into Wealth, I present seven different ways to make seven figures with your book. Because I notice people, oftentimes, they didn't even mention in their in their bio, what their business is. They didn't have a call to action and a good reason to go to their website. They hadn't thought through, am I gonna use this book to become a public speaker, to start a media company? They hadn't thought it through. 
And that was such a loss because they would launch their book and, you know, crickets. They wouldn't have any reviews. They couldn't really leverage the book. And then it's a, a little bit harder to do it later, but it's not impossible. So I wanted to uh, just make it very clear what are some systems that I've used, my clients have used, or famous people that, you know, people have known about, um, have used in order to monetize a book. Of course, the one that you, you are so great at is public speaking. So most people who are public speakers have a book or several. It's kind of like having a degree. You almost have to have a book to speak at a certain level or even to get on podcasts. It's kind of expected because the effort that you put into creating your book communicates clearly that you have the stories, you have the expertise, you have something of value to share. And speaking is the highest paid profession. So that's one of the seven ways to make seven figures with your book. Um, another way is to attract premium clients at premium prices by being the number one authority. Now, I'm not sure if your books have helped your lumber business because that's kind of a separate silo, but I'm sure that your books have helped you as a speaker, as a presenter, as a podcast host, as a podcast guest, and now they're launching a media empire. So that's very interesting. And maybe I'll just touch on one other way. So I've written, it's, a, it's more difficult to launch movies um, from nonfiction, although it can be done. So I've written these fantasy books, which are inspired by C.S. Lewis, of course, the Narnia series. Yeah. So Magic, Mystery, and the Multiverse. You know, the first book won the Reader's Choice Award, Best Book for Teens, as well as several other awards that you can see on the back here. And the second book is uh, number one, a new, new release on Amazon, and number one in its category. And they've all, you know, got uh, hundreds of, of reviews and great, we've sold uh, around maybe 50,000 books, something like that so far. So, but with a non with a nonfiction book, you can sometimes pitch it to Hollywood. Uh, an example would be uh, Marie Kondo and her Joy of Tidying Up. That was a curious story. So Netflix did a TV series based on Tidying Up, and Marie Kondo has a nonfiction book. She doesn't even speak English as her native language because she's Japanese. But there's a, a lovely series that came out of that book, that nonfiction book. And for my fantasy series, BBC has expressed interest in turning it into a TV series. So I'll keep you posted on that one. So those are three different ways to monetize a book and turn your book you know, into a seven figure stream of income. But I really encourage anybody who's thinking about writing a book, why not think through one or several monetization strategies? Because if you have at the back of the book, I'm a speaker, here's how to contact me. It's going to make that book so much more effective as part of your, as part of your magnet, your attraction uh, process. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and that's what I like about your book, that even for me as somebody that uh, is not necessarily relying on book sales only, although it's very part, uh, important, but to read your book, Turn Words Into Wealth, deals with a lot of issues that are new to me in terms of a whole different approach to not only writing books, but what it really means as a platform and how it introduces you. And then the other thing it does, this one I wrote uh, five, six years ago, and, and dealing mm -hmm. with all the things against all odds. But the other part that I got from you is that this one has been out there already for five, six years. It needs an extension because the amazing things have not ended at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm still living them today. I'm still negotiating some of the big business deals that would not even be conceivable at the time that I wrote these. And at 84, I'm still putting deals together that are amazing in the forest industry and in the warehousing and in and, and, uh, and the real estate uh, as well as in the media one because I intend to start a platform uh, that is simply not out there that has all these billions of people around the world that are having all the same issues, all the same challenges that we have, and that are still 
uh, I look at, uh, uh, you know, podcasting in particular, it's just at its infancy at this point, in my opinion. And as you and me are sitting here, you from Los Angeles, me from Central British Columbia, and be sitting here like, uh, this is the first time that we met in person, but obviously we have interacted because of our books and, and having so many other similarities that, you know, there we are sitting having this discussion for an hour and you become a very, very important part of where I'm going from here on forward and success and, and having you available as an expert, hopefully to me and where do I go from here? And at the same time as people watch this and will watch it as it goes forward, we already know that our podcast will be watched by tens of thousands of people around the world. I know that. Well, absolutely. What's really cool about a couple of things that you said are really cool. So what is wonderful in my book, Turn Words Into Wealth, I am very strongly uh, recommending that people consider independent publishing or self-publishing because you own and control it. So I think so many industries have been uh, shaken up and the middle, the middleman is usually eliminated. Like how many people use travel agents these days? You know, you, you just gen tend not to. So the really cool thing about your media company having published your books is you can easily add another chapter or two at the end. But then what's really cool is we can publish it as a second edition with a 2025 copyright date. So it's a new book and it can be, we can apply for awards, we can get some momentum. It's a brand new book with a second edition with a new ISBN. And, but you could basically keep 80% of the book. There's nothing wrong with the book, but just adding on to updating what's happened and with an invitation to, you know, play with you in the media silo that you're just launching, you know, as we speak. So this is a really wonderful thing. So many people still think they have to go to a big New York publisher. And I would just wanna tell a couple of quick stories so that uh, people will hopefully let go of that old way of thinking. So some best-selling self-published books include Your Erroneous Zones by Wayne Dyer, it sold 35 million copies, e, e. Ragan, which is a fantasy book, 30 million copies, Rich Dad, Poor Dog, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, sold 26 million copies, a self-published book. 50 Shades of Grey was initially self-published, and that's a phenomenal book. And I also want to talk about David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me, which has generated about $30 million. He was initially told, if you self-publish this book, you'll sell at most 5,000 copies. You're a loser if you self-publish. Well, David Goggins is anything but a loser. And he decided to independently publish. I think that's a more accurate term than self-publish. Anyway, he decided to do that because he didn't want anyone else to own his own story. He didn't want somebody uh, revising it. He wanted it to be his truth and he wanted to be able to speak on stages and say what he wanted and not have some publisher saying, no, you can't say that. So more or less to meet his own need for freedom, he independently published Can't Hurt Me. He's also got dyslexia and learning disabilities, and ADHD and all kinds of challenges. So he worked, you know, with a professional writer to create a beautiful and professional book. And then he went on podcasts to promote it. And I believe he sold in the first year a million copies of the book and 600,000 copies of the audio book by getting out there and talking about it, which is something that you're very good at doing also. But $30 million, if he had done that same amount of promotion, done the same great book, but been with another publisher, he would have been lucky to make 10% of that lucky. at most. So yeah. there are so many financial reasons to um, go independently. You're going to have to do the marketing anyway. <laughs> so why only keep five or 10% of the revenue if you are still the one who is the marketing engine? So there's a couple of examples. So when I found your book, turn words into wealth. I said, she wrote it for me. <laughs> she did. Oh, she great. did. You know, you did. It's, you wrote it for me. And, and so, 
you know, and I agree with all the things that you said. So, but I knew right from the beginning, I don't need the money from the books at this point, but I want to control the book. It's our book. I'm self-publishing. Yeah. And, and uh, so, and, and I know all of them individually, collectively will sell a million copies. I was always convinced of that. And, but when we are ready, we are ready. And I don't feel that my team is in place right now. I have a very good team, but we now mm -hmm. go to the next level. And that's right. where other experts get into our team. One of them called Aurora Winter and others, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. saying, where do we go from here and how do we get there? And then that includes also the platform, the books, the speaking. Speaking, I yeah. love to do presentations. I just love it and I'm good at it. The only problem with it is that a lot of times it takes me uh, coming from Central British Columbia two days to do a presentation somewhere in the States and, and wherever it is. And then uh, there are a couple hundred, uh, whatever number of people are there. But it takes, and I say that respectfully, uh, I love to do presentations on ADHD, things that are very close to my heart. But in general sense, a lot of times it takes so much time. This media podcasting, much more effective in terms of reaching a lot of people and a lot of individuals. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the media is changing now. We are, I want to be part of the new media. The old media is newspapers, uh, uh, television programs, all those other things are old media. I want to be part of the new media that includes books, uh, the includes presentation, it includes podcasting, and it includes a platform for me and what uh, I believe is, uh, has a huge potential. Well, YouTube has got what? It's like the fourth most uh, visited site after Google, which probably is going to be replaced by ChatGPT. So, you know, there's a lot of potential to create a media uh, broadcasting empire uh, leveraging YouTube, which is basically podcasting. But pod your podcast could be, uh, could be conceived as more of a, of a TV show but on, on YouTube using the new media. That would be one, one possible thing we could explore offline. <laughs> yeah, so all of these things, and for the people watching us in this discussion, you know, the, uh, it started with me reading you a book, Turn Birds Into Wealth, and I said, my God, she's talking about me. It gave me so much information at a critical time where we are doing well on where we are today. We are very, we are top 1% podcasters globally. And, and so, Congratulations. well, thank you. And then at the same time, I know we can go further, but if we do, we need, you know, we have a very, very good team, but we have to bring together the next level of teams. Where do we go from here? How do we get there? And that includes yeah. all the things that I'm doing. That includes the books, that do, uh, includes uh, speaking, or presentations, keynotes, presentations. It includes uh, media, uh, maybe podcasting, and it includes the podcasting or the platform dealing with issues that I believe have not been fully effectively dealt with. And I believe it has huge potential globally. And, and that's exactly what we will talk well, about have, in the next couple of weeks. We have a lot to talk about between these four books and also all the new things that you're doing. Uh, if I may, I want to share one more quick story before yeah, yeah. we run out of time to just uh, encourage the listeners and watchers to really devote a little bit more time to reading books and learning about communication and practicing communication, whether they practice it by speaking, by recording themselves on audio, by recording themselves on video, or by writing. So I love to always back up my intuition if I can get data to prove it. That's always wonderful. That appeals to the part of me that you know has an MBA. So there's a wonderful book called Significant Objects. And they did the perfect experiment. They took 100 distinct objects. They put them on eBay with a story or without a story. The stories were written by 100 different people. Some were professional writers, some were not. And they were transparent what they were doing on eBay. They weren't deceiving anybody. 
Um, but some of the stories, the stories did not add hype. They added significance. So an example would be um, somebody selling pot mitts on eBay. And they, they said the story, you know, I, I remember coming home uh, from school and my mother bringing out chocolate chip cookies from the oven with these pot mitts and we would enjoy you know, milk and cookies after school. And I have such a fond memory of that. Now, if you buy those pot mitts, you're not getting the cookies, but it adds significance. So as you're sharing your stories on your podcast or in your books, what difference does it make both to you, John, and also to everybody else? So that's why I loved this uh, experiment and the Significant Objects book reported how much the income increased, how much the revenue increased just by having a story. Some of the stories, you know, added significance that was even negative, but it was not bland. It was not neutral. So I, I, you may have read about this in my book, but if you haven't, yeah, yeah. do you want to hazard a guess at how much the, the revenue increased? Yeah, I, I, do you remember I, I, reading about it? Yeah, I remember reading, I forgot the number, very impressive. 27 times. Yeah. So 2,700%. So most people, when I share this story, they guess, oh, maybe the income increased 30% or sometimes they'll go on the limb and say, well, maybe it doubled. But the stories can add 27 times the revenue. So potentially. So I really encourage people that... Most people, most entrepreneurs, most leaders spend a lot of time thinking about their product or their service or their team, but they don't necessarily devote as much time to practicing their communication, to creating a million dollar message. You know, in the book, Turn Words Into Wealth, there are multiple examples of, of million dollar messages. So I really invite you to know that it's really worth your while to spend time becoming a great communicator. I like it, uh, uh, Aurora. It, with your book in particular, you know, I, I use it so often. I'm not a very big book reader because my ADHD and dyslexia, uh, you know, I don't read too many books. Uh, but with yours, I go through it all the time, from back to front to back, because it is so interesting in a number of a, a lot of areas. The other thing I quickly before we end is just going to say that my life changed when I found this book and I knew I had ADHD from the time I was 13 when I became a laborer uh, in the opinion and I questioned myself who am I until I went to my doc I uh, this book I found when I was 57 five years later I went to the doc that delivered our two daughters and was a personal friend I was 62 then and he said hey John why are you here I said I think I got ADHD and we checked out I do so the point that I'm making, for nearly 50 years, I struggled with ADHD and questioning who I was. And only mm -hmm. then, when I read that book and found out, my life changed. So from the time that I became an author, a, a very effective speaker, a podcaster, I was already 62 years old. But so, mm -hmm. And then the other part about it is that this only happened when in 2008 I had a case of diverticulitis nearly killed me and I thought I have to do more about uh, uh, you know this is virtually another podcast but I that kind of triggered me health and diet and exercise is important all of that happened virtually after I was 60 so for wow. people that said I'm too old no you're not you're never too old that is in the mind stay the course and and then uh, you know that there is always time. Aurora, we'll have to stay in touch. We'll talk after uh, we end the, this podcast a little bit about you and me in terms of when we get together. For all those people watching us from around the world, make sure buy the book and uh, you know the uh, and uh, you know the subscribe to our podcast both for Aurora and for myself share it, like it, make comments on it, and then, uh, you know, keep watching our podcast. And uh, Aurora, it was a privilege, and I was so looking forward to this podcast with you and me. I get so excited about it. So, uh, <laughs> again, thanks for being on my podcast. We'll talk a little bit after we end this podcast. May I, and may I just leave the gift for the listeners? If they go to turnwordsintowealth.com, 
or samepagepublishing.com. They'll get five free videos about how to attract capital clients and media coverage, and they'll get the ebook of Turn Words Into Wealth. So that's my gift for your listeners. Thank you, Arona. My privilege. Thank you, John. Thank you again. Take care. Thank you.